Welcome to Ural of New England. Uh, my name is Dimitri, and I'm here with Daryl. Daryl, and with our four-legged friend. Yep, Wiley's here visiting us as well. Wiley's visiting here, and uh, dogs are no stranger to sidecars. So today we're talking about uh, Ural owner orientation. So when we sell a motorcycle, there's a whole process of uh, taking delivery of the bike. And today we're gonna cover it all. We've delivered literally hundreds of bikes, uh, probably thousands of them. Yeah, I would think so over the, over the many years that we've been selling Euros. Yes, and uh, we figured this, is, uh, this video is overdue. So we're gonna pretty much take you through the process. If you already have a Euro, you may find a couple of uh, helpful points. And if you are considering getting one, this is gonna be super helpful, especially if you already bought one and about to take a delivery, hopefully through Ural of New England. We have four locations and we are reporting from our Boxborough location. So let's get started. So we're actually gonna take you a couple of steps uh, back. And uh, when we receive the motorcycle, it comes in a crate. It's a substantial structure when it comes in this, tray, in, in this crate. It's engineered and it has a metal frame, it has hinges, and it, it's just amazing how it all fits together. And when we unpack it, it's we like always- a, It's like a puzzle, everything fits in, you yeah, know, compactly. Uh, all together. So we do, uh, then our technician goes through and sets up the bike. Uh, we do consider if it's gonna be a bike, a stock bike, factory configuration, or it's going to be one of our special uh, builds. And those, we have a section on our website, definitely check that out. So depending how it is, the bike gets set up. And then it goes in our showroom. It may spend there a few days, it may spend there a few weeks, but at some point, it's going to get ready for delivery. And that's how we get to our very first uh, piece of paperwork. And it says Ural Motorcycle Dealer Setup and Pre-Delivery. And I'll uh, ask Daryl to go through. Um, so the things we do, we clean all surfaces of the motorcycle. We place all included accessories, um, owner's manual, air pump, tools, touch up. And do we have all these items here? Uh, all the items are, are right over here, the ones that are applicable. Uh, they haven't used the air pump in quite a few years, but that's still on the checklist. It is on the checklist, and uh, they stopped doing the air pumps. So uh, let's get close to, and we're going to check out the owner's manual. Uh, the thing with the owner's manual is not only does it tell you how to operate the machine, but it also tells you a lot of service information as well. So the Ural's have been designed to be maintained by a customer, depending on their skill level. And the owner's manual comes right in hand with that. It provides quite a bit of information. Um, also, we have the toolkit that comes with it. And there again, it is designed for customer maintenance. As you can see, it's pretty extensive. Comes with standard tools, uh, metric opening and boxing wrenches, Allen wrenches, and then there's also special tools like a shock spanner, the uh, special tool to get the um, spare tire off and that sort of thing. And it also comes with touch-up paint. Every bike has a touch-up paint kit as well. And actually it has, depending on the color combination, you may uh, end up with three or four of them. There's a bottle for each color, depending on the, the color of the motorcycle. I think that uh, uh, cinnamon camo, I think it has four bottles. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so now we make sure all the items are in there. We do all the pre-delivery adjustments. Uh, and we road test the bike. And in fact, uh, we also check all the controls, all the operation, engine performance, shifting, braking, overall hand handling, and the sidecar alignment. These bikes, just like the car, they have an alignment. That's so, right, it's very important to sidecar. Yes. Um, so then our technician signs off on the pre-delivery and our service manager signs off on the pre-delivery and then we do get, we make sure the bike is nice and clean and it's ready for either uh, showroom delivery or maybe transportation. And so then we get this out of the way. 
And as the bike owner, you also sign off on the sheet to make sure that these items were done. And of course, we always get them done. We now get to the uh, most uh, comprehensive uh, orientation sheet, and it, it used to be called your old card of delivery. Uh, it, it is just, uh, the heading now is just as URL, but uh, let's go through it. So the way we're gonna do it is we're gonna cover item by item as it's listed on the sheet. And then later in this video, we will dive in in the Q and A's that are also very, very important. So we're gonna start off with uh, first section is called pre-trial run. So we're gonna start with the throttle. Which is right here. Uh, brakes, front. Front brake is here. Rear brake is here. And to note, this pedal also controls the brake on the sidecar. So one pedal, two brakes. Uh, clutch. This side here, cable actuated. Uh, starter switch. Starter switch is right here under the and yes, make sure you neutral. Uh, engine cutoff switch. It's right here. Turn signal. This side, left, right, push to cancel. There is not an auto cancel. You have to manually cancel them. And the horn button. Horn button is right under the turn signals. So we're gonna go over the uh, running, uh, starting and running the bike. Since we're in the showroom, we are not gonna start it right this moment, so we don't inhale some of the bad stuff. Uh, but as far as uh, starting the bike, let's go over that. Yeah, there's a, uh, this bike's fuel injected, um, and there's an electric starter on it as well as a kickstart, but the starting procedure is very simple. You switch the key to the on position, and you hit the starter button. There's no choke, there's no fuel valve, or any of that stuff to deal with. You just hit the button, and you're off and running. And as far as uh, uh, break-in procedure, which is the next thing? Break-in procedure. Uh, we tell everybody the, fir the first service should be done about 300 miles. Um, break-in is very important. Um, you should operate the bike a specific way between now and break-in. Uh, you shouldn't be riding it on the highway. Back roads on and off the throttle are ideal for breaking in the motorcycle. Uh, not rev too high, not have it in too low a gear where the uh, engine's lugging. Yeah, and it's, again, Daryl covered some most important topics, but it is, there's a section the owner's manual that covers that in great detail. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have the tire pressure. Very important. Yeah. Check each one. Each tire has a different pressure because of the weight the motorcycle places on that particular tire. So pay that, pay close attention to that as well. Uh, we covered the importance of the motorcycle alignment. It's mentioned in this uh, list. Mm -hmm. uh, battery tender recommendation. Uh, battery in the motorcycle is an AGM glass mat battery. So it's not a lithium or a gel. So any battery uh, charger, tender that you'll pick up at your local hardware store, auto parts store, whatever, should be sufficient. Just make sure it's for a motorcycle. Um, so the amperage is limited to a certain amount. Yeah, and um, we offer a lot of value added features when we set up the bike. Uh, we go in above and beyond what's required by factory. One thing we do, at least currently, we've done it for years, uh, we've pre-wired all our motorcycles at no charge with the, uh, with the harness for the uh, trickle charger connection. And it's usually would be on the left side of the bike. Um, so definitely make sure you use it if you store the bike for how long? I usually say uh, a month just to be on the safe side. Uh, with the technology, the chargers they have now, you could park the bike and plug the charger in and forget about it. So if it sets for a week or if you happen to get busy and it sets for a month or two, it's always ready to go. Yeah, we put that connector in the convenient spot so you can actually certainly if you plan on storing it for a month or longer definitely plug it in but like Daryl said even if you uh, just park your bike 
for a few days. Life does get in the way, and yep. sometimes that next day turns out to be that next month. So you always want your bike ready to go. Yep. So we covered the pre-trial run uh, list, and we get to the next section that's called uh, trial run. So during the trial run, we uh, cover the clutch performance, brake performance, smooth shifting, engine performance, handling at steady speed, handling during deceleration, handling during acceleration. So let's start with the clutch performance. Clutch performance, yes. It is a cable actuated clutch, so it um, feels a little different than a hydraulic, and it also is a dual plate dry clutch. So there again, feels a little different. So you just have to kind of get used to the engagement of it and um, still very smooth. Um, it's got a lot of bite to it because it needs that with the sidecar. That's one of the many features this bike has that makes it sidecar specific. Uh, the surface area on the clutch is quite, a, quite large, so. And when Daryl says a little different, it's actually in a very, very good way. Uh, because it has a dual dry clutch with a lot of surface, you have a lot of control with that clutch. It doesn't just kick in. You have a lot of control, and it's very, very smooth. And it's very soft, too. Very so soft. So it doesn't take, it doesn't, even though with, with the way the clutch is designed, it's also designed to be operated with not very much strength, so you don't have to worry about yeah. having a problem doing it. It's easy. And there are some adjustments on the lever, so you can actually kind of pre-position the, the, the lever. Um, there's a range. Now we get into the brake performance. That's an interesting one. Brake performance. Brakes are separate to some degree. Um, front brake actuates the front brake of the motorcycle. The rear brake pedal actuates the sidecar and the rear of the motorcycles. There's an adjustment that allows a balance of the two. So when you have to apply the brake, brakes abruptly that the car stops squarely and straightly. Um, but yeah, this, this system allows you to be able to use the brakes however you see fit and you're not pigeonholed into doing what some electronic device wants you to do. Yes, and there's something about uh, Ural motorcycles because you're on three wheels, if you occasionally lock your front wheel or lock your back wheel or sidecar or even all three of them it is something you want to avoid but if it does happen it is a much le it, 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 you're still on three wheels you're not going sideways you, it, it's mm -hmm. still so you can control these things and uh, i find it is good to know those lockup points so at some point early on in you learning your own motorcycle you do want at low speed at the controlled environment, you do want to exercise the front brake or your foot brake to kind of lock up those wheels to just see what happens with the bike at low speed at right. your comfort level. Yeah, so you don't have any trepidations about using it in a panic situation. Yes, but it is a lot more forgiving mm -hmm. than on the two wheel bikes. We all know what happens yes. there. So um, safety is the most important thing. So keep it, keep it safe. Um, and as far as keeping safe, the other uh, five items on this lift, list, which is smooth shifting, engine performance, add different uh, riding parameters, steady speed, deceleration, acceleration. Let's talk about that and how, the reason I kept them those five and one, because it contributes to your bike dynamics. So let's talk about that, Daryl. Yeah, I mean, aside, everybody knows the sidecar rig is different than a motorcycle. And certain things like brake and throttle input cause the motorcycle to do certain things. So that's one of the reasons why we always review this kind of thing. Aftermarket setups, poorly setups are dramatically different and cause these effects, I mean, to a, a larger degree. So it really affects things. Uh, just to clarify, what Daryl means by aftermarket setups, that means non euro sidecar motorcycles correct in, in other words someone buys a motorcycle we have a gorgeous royal enfield limited edition check that out on the website but if someone had a wild thought of putting a sidecar on that motorcycle that's what they're referring to as aftermarket setups because factory built factory engineered purpose engineered sidecar motorcycles this is it that's right. It's just Ural motorcycles. When did um, Harley-Davidson stop making their sidecars? 
Uh, I think they stopped making them in the late 90s, early 2000s. They quit doing them because they... At some, sometime yeah. in 2000s. Yeah. I, I, I didn't remember, but I know it was a while ago. And even those bikes were not truly... Correct. They were still add-ons. They're they still, still add-ons. They still took a motorcycle and put a sidecar on it that really was not really designed to handle it. So, yeah, they they look gorgeous, but we traded quite a few of those, mm -hmm. and they always for me they were always a scary thought to take one out for a ride. So um, that's what Daryl means by aftermarket setup. Ural, on the other hand, purpose built purpose engineered for so many years. They started off with an awesome bike and they end up with an unbelievable um, engineering uh, when it comes to sidecar motorcycle dynamics. And that's what those things are. So let's get back to uh, your thought of comparing this to the aftermarket setups. So the, the, uh, the inherent things that a sidecar rig does as far as throttle steering. Um, so your input of throttle will cause the bike to veer one way, the off the throttle will cause it to pull the other way. Very, very, very minimal with the Ural, where it can be quite uh, scary on an aftermarket setup. Because this is engineered to steer properly, to handle properly, uh, suspension wise, everything's conducive to having a sidecar on it. So these, these effects are very, very minimalized. Not a lot of people worry about learning how to ride a sidecar versus a motorcycle. Normally it takes two or three laps around the building and they've got it figured out. So very easy to get used to, um, but these are specific things that people hear about and they hear bad things about with non-ural setups that are very minimized here. And what I want to say is, yeah, there's, uh, there's definitely, we get a lot of calls and people are, like Daryl said, there's just, a, it's almost like a myth of sidecar. It's something just going to be, uh, well, first of all, why there is uh, uh, what Daryl referred to, and that's what it is, it, it's uh, throttle steer. Throttle steer. It's, it's very simple. It's actually very, very simple. Um, we have a motor vehicle that has a uh, track on one side and track on the other side. When you drive your, your car, it doesn't matter if it's this awesome Hummer or this in, incredible Bentley or some vintage cars, but you have four wheels on the road and you have two wheels, sometimes four wheels, that drive your vehicle forward. So when you accelerate, you have the same force on right side and you have the same force on left side so you, 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 it propels the vehicle forward in the same uh, force on both sides. When we get into the sidecar motorcycles, uh, we have only one side that propels it forward. So when you provide steering uh, throttle input, that side would want to go a little bit ahead of this side. Yeah, you're... And the better the bike is designed and engineered, less effect is going to be felt by the rider. So Ural minimizes that incredibly. They've done an amazing job. And then to make it even better, and we'll cover that, there's a steering damper. Maybe we should cover it in here because there's not a... Uh, it should be a line item. Yeah. Um, so now when you're braking, if you're braking with the throttle, it's the same effect. It just works in the reverse order you're slowing down with that one wheel when you're downshifting and releasing that clutch, mm -hmm. when you're slowing down with the uh, engine. And when that happens, this wheel is not braking, so it kind of wants to go around a little bit. Mm -hmm. But again, the, you have a regular bike with a sidecar. Those things could be dramatic. Yeah. And in fact, they are dramatic. With the Ural, they are all minimized, and in fact, you can, you can and you should use it to your advantage. You can have fun with it and you can take road conditions and take advantage of this feature and, and uh, make your ride, uh, how would you say? Uh, once you get used to this, this and you can use it to your advantage, especially on a curvy road where you can actually steer the bike with the throttle yeah. and allow the bike to 
pull correctly into the turn. So it just makes for a whole lot more fun. It's another enjoyable feature of a sidecar. It is. It, it is a lot of fun. That's what I was looking for. It's simple word, fun. Because you approach the right-hand turn and you come in a little bit slower and you can just feather that throttle just a little bit and it hugs the road. It makes that turn with very little steering effort. Mm -hmm. You come to a left-hand turn and you can come in a little bit quicker, decelerate or downshift, and again, it will do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are different conditions. You keep it safe with the speed and you still use your brakes. You do what you need to do, but you can certainly have this in your arsenal of riding tools. Mm -hmm. So, and that's, we kind of covered the uh, handling at steady speed. So when, when we're riding at steady speed, leveled uh, road surface, leveled as far as incline, what should be the bike behavior? It should be a very, very, very minimal amount of input to the handlebars. Yeah. And that's the way these are set up as. Absolutely. You're not, you're, you're not, you shouldn't be fighting it. You shouldn't be having to apply any, any extra pressure or anything like that to one side or the other to keep the bike straight. You should almost be, you know, should have just a very light feel on the bars on a rig like this that's properly designed. Yeah, and properly set up. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously if it's set up by a Ural dealer and all the uh, requ uh, manufacturer's recommendations or requirements are followed, that's how these bikes are. So, and then um, we have handling during deceleration. We covered yeah, we that. We covered the torque steer. Yeah. And handling during acceleration. Same. And technically, if you have an incline and you may not, you would not be accelerating, you're maintaining speed, but there's still going to be more torque from this side to make that hill. So you may experience a little bit. Very, very minimal. Very, very minimal. Yeah. Again, this is the beauty of buying a motorcycle, a Ural motorcycle with a sidecar. And someone may have a really good question. It would be like, okay, so these bikes are two-wheel drive. So if you're in two-wheel drive, and you're accelerating. They shouldn't be really be. A it's not really so much torque steer when you're accelerating and decelerating. Of course, you're off road too, so you're kind of slipping and sliding around too. That's right. So the two with the modern Ural motorcycles with two wheel drive, they have a solid axle, which means when you're in two wheel drive, you don't have a differential. Both wheels have a solid connection between each other. You wouldn't do it on the paved road. Uh, you maybe even a dry dirt road is not a, a good idea to do it because well, it's you can still... do it on it. I've, I've ridden one of the dirt roads and stuff. It's it, they'll slip and slide enough as long as you got a somewhat minimal traction, then you can uh, drive it accordingly. Yeah, that's right. So you need to. Uh, uh, it needs to be the road conditions that allow a little bit of slippage. So and then just taking one step back in the '90s and and way back, Ural did have a differential in their two-wheel drive system, which kind of made it a little bit easier. It was all the time on two-wheel drive system with the differential. Unfortunately, when you need a traction, the differential took, took all that away, mm -hmm. especially if you didn't have a passenger, that wheel would start spinning and you would lose traction very, very quickly. So Ural made that adjustment uh, early on and pretty much I would say after late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah, it was, it was only a couple of years, if I remember right, that they had that and um, they went back or yes. re-engineered it the way it's set yep. up now. So we completed the trial run section and now we are uh, getting into the uh, third section in the Ural card of delivery that's called post-trial run. We're talking about break-in procedure. We covered that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Warranty coverage service schedule, proper brake operation, uh, explaining gearbox, gear selection, including reverse and two-wheel drive. This is very important. We're going to spend some time there. And another one, critically important, review key usage. You have a couple of keys and you need to know which one goes 
wear. Mm -hmm. So let's start. Uh, we talked about break-in procedure. Anything else we need to cover? That, that pretty much covers it. I mean, as long as you're as long as you're riding a bike accordingly, realize that it, is, it does have to be broken in properly. Um, then I think that pretty much covers everything. You don't want to get out and take a long trip on it on the highway uh, until it's broken in. Since so you just want to just enjoy it on the back roads are the best way to do it. Yeah, and doing that, just like Daryl said, doing that service earlier on, I think it goes a long way. Yeah. Yeah, and it's definitely important. So uh, warranty coverage, there's a section in the owner's manual that as we do the util uh, delivery, we take you through and we will cover that in detail. But as far as warranty coverage, we have... It's two years unlimited mileage. Unlimited mileage. So you can go around the world if you wanted to in two years, mm -hmm. you'll have a full coverage. No limit to the miles. And Ural, uh, Urals are very good, very reliable bike. And the company itself uh, backs up the product phenomenally. As a dealer, we can tell you firsthand as far as the technical support, the technical portal that Ural offers for the dealers, uh, the parts support. Of course, way, way back, just like with any manufacturer when they're just getting the new product, I'm talking 90s, early 2000s, but in the modern day and age, you have uh, a phenomenal product. Anyone that's gonna look at this bike uh, that had motorcycles, they look at it and uh, it's just incredible, the quality, fit and finish, the materials used, the engineering, the implementations, how it's done. And the warranty, uh, goes right along with it because it is a reliable bike, but if something did happen, it's a complex machine these days. We have a part support, we have technical support, and uh, there are plenty of dealers in the country these days. So we covered the warranty. Service schedule, service let's schedules. talk about that. Um, service schedule, your first service is 300. Then after that, uh, we recommend doing the service every 3,000. Um, and it's pretty, uh, it's pretty involving. Uh, you want to make sure you take care of your motorcycle. I tell all my customers, I said, the two things, as long as you operate the bike within its design parameters and you service the motorcycle, it is just as reliable as anything else out there. So Yeah, that is absolutely true. And again, the owner's manual, even though it's called owner's manual, and we think of owner's manual as a tiny little book, and it has a couple of fuses and, and warning labels and safety things, this is more like a shop manual. It has electrical diagrams. It has all your maintenance procedures spelled out just like it is in the technical information portal for our technicians. Mm -hmm. It's the same information. So whether you do your own service or you bring it to an independent shop, yes, you can take your motorcycle to an independent non euro shop. And as long as the service done and documented in accordance with the um, service recommendations, uh, you still have a valid warranty coverage. So using that um, schedule, and if you want to do it ahead of time, it wouldn't hurt. It probably would help a lot. And, uh, but certainly not exceeding mm -hmm. those intervals is critically important. Uh, proper brake operation. I know we covered it prior, but in the post-trial run, I guess we would want to check with the bike owner who just took the bike on the road test. Do you have any questions about how the bike feels with, with the brake operation? Like Daryl said, your foot brake engages the sidecar wheel, the sidecar wheel and the bike wheel. Mm -hmm. And it has to be adjusted properly. So when you hit that brake in the semi-emergency or emergency situation, uh, the bike behaves uh, with, with a certain expectations. And I, I guess you don't want to just hit that. You certainly want to use your front brake to start your slowing down. Yeah, most people, come, especially coming off a motorcycle, favor the front brake. I know I usually use the front brake most of the time, but to add brakes, just like anything else, you, you add more of the rear. I know with these, if I'm backing up, I favor the rear versus the front, because if you're backing downhill and you hit the front brake, because you're catching what, it's that whole yeah. triangle effect, it tends to, the back kind of slides around a little bit. Yeah. So the front, the rear brake in that case allows you to modulate the brakes safer. So those things like that, that are make it a little bit different or certainly should be aware of. So what we would say, again, uh, learn your bike, 
uh, try it at slow speeds in the safe environment where you don't have other vehicles or pedestrian and exercise the brakes. Uh, that's a good point to also try it in reverse, mm -hmm. what the bike does in reverse. And also ride your bike in reverse. It's a mechanical reverse gear, just like it is in your car. You can go for miles. You can go for as long as your neck will allow you to do this and, and, and your body endure, but you can, you can go in reverse. It's, uh, uh, and um, so what we would say is definitely try that and get comfortable. Get comfortable with the steering, brakes, and overall bike dynamics. Speaking of steering, we're getting to the end of this list, so let's finish that list, and then we'll talk about the steering damper, which should have been in this list. We always cover it, but let's just cover the list. So the gearbox and gear selection, including reverse uh, and two-wheel drive. Okay, first off, the gearbox setup in this bike is what, what some people don't realize that back in the 70s, all these controls were standardized. So it's the gear selector is one down and however many gears the bike has left up. So in this case, it's a four speed gear selector, one down, three up. Very simple. Excuse me. Hmm? Five speed, one reverse. Ah, well, four speed plus four. reverse. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, in, in, in the case of operating a motorcycle in a forward manner, it's four speed. Then you have reverse. Um, that's just a matter of placing the bike in your neutral position on your forward gears, then pulling the clutch in, engaging reverse, let the clutch out just like you would any other car, back up, pull the clutch in, disengage reverse, back in first gear and go forward. So let's show the uh, pedal right here. Yep. And so as when you see, it's mounted on a singular shaft. So it's either on or off, depending on which way it's rocked and um, you would step on the forward part of that pedal. This engages, this disengages. This engages, yes. So if you want to engage it, you, you would use uh, your, your heel. Your heel. And just like any gears, when you try to engage them, they may or may not mesh right away. When yeah, I sometime, say- Sometimes you may have to feather the clutch a yes. little bit. So if they don't mesh, just, you don't have to hit it hard. Just release that clutch a tiny little bit, move those gears and, and they, you will feel yep. they'll, they'll go right in. And then you release your clutch and definitely go slow. In reverse, you don't want to kind yeah, of- No matter how good you are, steering a little different at backwards than forwards on a motorcycle. Yeah, yes. So then when you completed your maneuver, in reverse, you squeeze the clutch. Mm -hmm. Very simple. You push that pedal and it feels awesome and boom, you're back to neutral and you use the pedal on the opposite side, put in first gear and you can, you can go. Um, we also have uh, hand shifters. So check them out on our website because we do have the hand shifters that allow you to shift your reverse in and out right from your hand shifter. And there are a couple other options there too. Very exciting. So uh, we covered the reverse. Let's talk about forward gears. Forward gears. Forward gears, pretty much like any other motorcycle. One down, three up. Um, the another uh, another reason why these are are sidecar specific is because the engine design. You have eighty percent of the engine torque below two thousand available below two thousand RPMs. So you very well can just ease the clutch right out and not have to hardly give it any gas for it to pull away on itself. Um, so it's very torquey. Um, the engine itself is designed more for peak torque than RPMs. So it doesn't require a lot of revving to stay in the torque curve. Um, most people, when you're riding, especially on back roads, you're usually in third gear. So um, very easy, um, puts out a wide torque curve. So you don't, you're not in a gearbox shifting it a lot. So the keys. That's, keys. That, keys are important. Key, key, You're not going anywhere without the keys. Yes. And um, this bike has a lot of things you can lock up. From the tiny little key uh, to the large key and the two keys in between. So let's uh, get that out of the way. And by the way, look at this gorgeous Ural motorcycle leather. Uh, keychain. So each motorcycle comes with at least three keys. You have a key for the ignition switch, 
You have a key for the fuel cap and you have a key for the trunk. The bikes that are equipped with the toolbox on the gas tank come with a fourth key. Optional. Optional, that's what I said. Comes with ones that have this. Yes. Um, the keys are pretty easy to recognize. The uh, uh, ignition key is a small square. The trunk key is an oval small and the gas cap key actually has gas written on it. So you can't mistake that. Um, and then the uh, toolbox keys here. Yep. So the gas key. Uh... And usually what I tell everybody yeah. is that you, you don't, you, you only have to have the ignition key and the toolbox key handy to operate the motorcycle. You can leave the gas cap unlocked and you can leave the trunk unlocked. So if you don't want to fumble around with four keys, you can, leave, you can carry the two with you. You can put the other two on a key ring. You can put them in the trunk. You can put them under the storage seat, under the sidecar seat. If you get somewhere where you think somebody might steal your gas or you think you went out and bought groceries and you want to lock up the trunk, you can do that. But you don't have to carry around four keys with you all the time. So let's just uh, point to the keys and see how they look. Uh, very so, simple. So very this simple. is locked. This is not going anywhere. To unlock, it goes up. We open this. And let's cover the fuel cap because fuel that could get confusing. It does. I have people ask about that. The fuel cap is unlocked when it comes off. So right now it's unlocked. Now, when you lock it, it won't, it won't come off. It so, spins but you, freely. But it spins freely. So even though you can turn it, it still won't, the, the mechanism inside won't engage and lay or remove it. So this is technically the lock position. Quarter turn, now it's back to unlocked. As you can see, this key is pretty small, so you have to be a little bit careful with it. The thing I always tell people when you're using the toolbox key is make sure that it's inserted completely. That way everything engages, takes nothing to unlock it, and then you can open it up. You can see the uh, available space inside. And it's what, two and a half inches deep? Yeah, this takes up, a, a, this, this changes the fuel capacity by a quarter of a gallon. Oh, okay. So any, any, any year old that does not have this toolbox has a five gallon gas tank. Anyone that has a toolbox has 4.75 gallons. Yeah, not a big difference. And it's about two inches deep, uh, about maybe five inches square. So. And the last key we have here, uh, it's let's show the most important that. one, yeah, the ignition key. Yeah, this is key. the most important one. Okay, ignition key. Ignition key goes in the switch. Switch has three positions, run, uh, off, run, and park. Always make sure you take, you have it in the correct position when you remove the key, because you can remove the key in the park position. You have still this is on, the park lights on, both tail lights are on. Uh, in the daytime situation when you're not paying attention, you can kill the battery by leaving this on. So just always make sure you do that. It will not come out, out in the run position, so and so the run position is pretty much 12 o'clock. Uh, the parking lights on position is like one o'clock. And, and yes, you can pull it out and uh, that will drain the battery. So you need to make sure when you turn off the bike, you always rotate the key counterclockwise, kind of like this way. And that comes out. Um, if I had a few people ask, so why, why is there a position like this? Why, why would you even have this position? So it is required in some countries because if you park on the side of the road in certain areas, you're required to have some running lights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, safety and feature. A safety feature. And of course, with incandescent bulbs, it will not take long. Like how many amp hours that battery is? Uh, it's a 19 amp hour battery. So yeah, it's a say 20 amp hour battery. And between those lights, you may have probably at least three amps running, mm -hmm. maybe even four yeah. amps. So five hours, you'll be down to zero. 
two hours, you may still start it. Yeah, but okay. anything over two hours will drain the battery. A good, healthy battery will drain it. But there is such a thing as LED lights. Conversion to LED lights cuts, cuts down on the drain of the battery overall quite a bit. Yeah, like like 80%. Yeah, 80%. Something like at that. At least. Um, and you get some good light lighting and also you can... It's more durable too. Yeah. That you don't have to worry about bulb failure like you do with an incandescent bulb. Yeah, so that's just a side note. But that is important. I'm glad we touched on that because we, we, we know of many instances where batteries were down. Very easy. We completed two very important stages in Ural owner orientation. We're down to the customer checklist. And we're gonna go through it. The first item on the checklist is pre-trial, trial, post-trial post runs were completed and fully explained. Did we do that, there? I think we covered it pretty well. We covered that. The next one, we are, that's a new one. We haven't talked about it there. It's the um, warning labels, reviewed and explained. There are some cool ones. Some of them are actually kind of funny. One of them is funny. Yeah. I always, I always find it very funny. Do you want to start with the funny one? Let's start with the funny one. Okay. No, no, we have to show it. It yeah. has to be on the camera. Yeah, you got to show it on the camera. Not for gas and drinking water. This is the thing. Or, and, and are uh, here making a dramatic difference. Mm -hmm. So it says not for gas, and drinking water. So it's, I guess it suggests what? It's, it's people, people, a lot of people inherently come back with, so what am I supposed to use it for? Yeah. And I always say, well, well what it actually means is pick one and go for it. Don't mix them up. Don't put water in it this week and gas in it next week and vice versa. Well, I wouldn't use it for drinking water anyway, Yeah. but even uh, any other water, I guess, I wouldn't mix, you wouldn't want to mix it with gas in any shape Correct. or form. So you just need to pick one. So that's an interesting label. We kind of got that out of the way. Uh, the next one is the gas label, which is Premium very fuel important. Only. That's very important. So what does that say? Just this premium fuel only. Yes. So the newer bikes, they have a high compression uh, ratio. When I say newer bikes, I think it's from 2022. 2022. They just started putting this label on the uh, the last last years. Yeah, and but they were always recommended for 91. I always tell everybody, you know, if it's my motorcycle, I'd run 91 in it just to be on the safe side. Not so much for the compression ratio at the time, but especially in the summertime with the sidecar rig, it helps the engine deal better with the heat. Yes, but now with the high compression, uh, it is a it's hard a requirement. requirement. So just keep that in mind. Uh, what else do we have for the labels on the bike? Well, this one's a very important one here. Yep. This one warns about how a sidecar does not handle like a motorcycle, yep. ride it accordingly. So definitely read all the labels, including that one. And a lot of that we covered in um, our a checklist when we talked about bike dynamics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember I did a follow-up call and one customer, uh, ref and I told him, how's it going with the Ural? And he says, loving it as usual, Ural delay factor, family loves it. Uh, but he, he and, I, I, and I know he had some questions about dynamics in, and then I said, so how's it going with just riding it? What, what can you say? And he said, well, to me, it, it looks like it, it's like my ATV, except it's two different ATVs. When I turn on the right side, it feels a little different. When I turn on the left side, it feels a little different. So I got used to it and it just it took him a couple hours. But yes, it is important when you have another person riding the bike, that's probably why the label is there. You may be, and you probably are very comfortable when you ride the bike, but if you have another individual maybe borrowing the bike, maybe there may be circumstances. We don't want to think, but theoretically, a thief <laughs> could get on the bike. Well, if you, if you, you know, the nice thing with the sidecar is you don't have to hold it up. 
So you can let your wife ride it. That's if she right. puts you in the sidecar, yep. she needs to know what's going on so as well. So that is an important reminder for any rider, a new rider or experienced rider, that you are getting on a motorcycle, but it's a different motor vehicle. So that label will remind you that it is very important. Um, the next label. Most of the have? other labels, those are the important ones. The other ones are pretty much the government required stuff. Yeah. You've got EPA requirements, you've got decibel level requirements, things like that. So these are all the ones that are required by state and fe by federal law to have on there. And they, they, they are important labels. So yeah. you, you definitely uh, need to get familiar. So th these are the labels right here. Yeah, because sometimes uh, if you go to get it inspected yeah. in certain states, they're gonna want to know where the label is for this particular thing. So being familiar with them and being able to point them out quickly is a- Yeah, that's an emission one, very important. Here's another one right here. And the VIN number of the bike is, I know it's, it's engraved, is it? It's, it's, on a, it's on a sticker and it's embossed into the frame too. Yes. You gotta have it both places. Yes, and, and they're actually doing an awesome job. I, I, I hope, I wish car manufacturers done it this way because the one that is uh, kind of like, I call it engraved in the- Stamped. Stamped. It also has a, a heavy duty clear sticker so that the dirt doesn't get in there and you can just wipe it off nice and clean. That's just one level of quality. Also helps it last longer too because that adds an extra layer of protection because that stamping is done over the, over the powder coating. So just to make sure that it stays clean and dry. And so, uh, I think we covered pretty much all the labels uh, yeah. so far. No, there's one here. That that, color code. Uh, it's a color code. So it actually has the VIN. And there's a color code right below that. There is one other label. Mm -hmm. It's not, a, there is one other label that I always cover too. This oh. label. Oh yes, let's do that. So one more label is this label. Yeah, let's talk about that. This is that. a fuse relay diagram, fuse uh, box diagram. Yeah. These bikes have two fuse boxes. They have a main fuse box here. This label shows the relays and the fuses and how everything's laid out in that fuse box. So if you're looking for the light, light fuse, it's number five, shows you where it's at and all that. So the, the other, other fuse box for this bike is in the sidecar. Excellent. And then uh, we, since we are on the fuses, like you said, there's another fuse yeah. box. We want to get into that a little bit more. There's yeah. another fuse box right here. That fuse box has four fuses inside of it. And what you want to do is you want to consider, the, consider that the sidecar fuse box. Inside that fuse box, under normal conditions, two of the fuses are used. One is by this power port, and one is by the driving lights that are up front. The other two fuses are open, which means they're usable to add accessories on, so it allows for expansion of the electrical system. Absolutely. And um, the next item on this list is actually all controls. Um, explain and adjust it to the customer. We do have a common question about the switch. What does it do and why it's there? That's and why sweet. doesn't it do anything on the new Euro motorcycle? I think when Ural started building sidecars, they bought a couple of tractor trailer loads of these switch boxes because the switch originally was for the spotlight. That is correct. Yeah. That's, that's what it was there for all this time. Uh, but in the evolution of the motorcycle, uh, they felt like this was too aggravating or hard to get to for the rider. So they added this switch to control the spotlight. Then they decided to change the spotlight over to the LEDs. To the driving lights. LED, yes. so, Eric, so they still use this switch. Yep. So that switch is still there. It's not used for anything. It allows for expansion, just like the two fuses. Yes, that is correct. And that is actually a heavy duty switch. The one that you flip and you feel good about it. Mm -hmm. It's like, and they haven't failed. They, they work awesome. They, they waterproof. They have this waterproof cap. So we do use it for different accessories. Yeah. If, you add the, if you want to add a spotlight on here. That's, that's correct. That's the switch to use. Um, so what Daryl said is 100% correct. There are four circuits in that fuse box. Two of them are currently used. 
in the motorcycle and two of them are available uh, for additional accessories. One of those circuits is on that switch. Mm -hmm. So we are on controls and uh, adjustments for the customer. We're gonna cover them, uh, there are a couple of things that we fine tune uh, for the actual rider. But one of the things we didn't talk about in detail is the hydraulic steering damper. And the original ones were the mechanical ones. Yes, friction type. Friction type where you set it and it's that setting no matter what the dynamics are. With hydraulic ones, they react to road conditions better. So in other words, if you're just going smooth, you will have lesser resistance. If there's something that really jerked the steering, it will act up accordingly. Mm -hmm. But you still have the adjustments. So how many adjustments? There's 21 clicks, it's 21 different adjustments, yep. so you can fine tune it in to operate the way you'd like it to operate. Um, if you want more of a dampening effect on it, you turn it clockwise. Um, Usually in this situation is when you're riding in a bumpy area or off-road where your front end is going to get tossed around more. Yep. Um, the other scenario is as, as, as you lean the other direction, more of a smooth, even curvier road where you want easier response to the front end, you take the dampening off so you turn it counterclockwise. Yep. And you can certainly start in the middle and see how yep. it goes. It's and just, there's no right or wrong to it, just whatever's comfortable. But this is a phenomenal feature and it works amazing. We do have an off-road steering damper, which is a heavy duty one that gets installed uh, in between the uh, front suspension and actually the sidecar. But that is something that is not designed for road use, it's really for mm -hmm. off-road use. It's very easy to put it on and take it off depending on where you are, but for off-road use that thing is awesome too. While we're on the controls and adjustments to the customer, to the rider, mm -hmm. what are the things that we keep in mind and what are the things that the bike owner can fine tune for themselves when they actually ridden the bike for a while? The biggest thing is up here, handlebars. You can loosen the clamps up, move the bars up and down a certain, a certain amount based on your height, your comfort level. Also moving the levers up and down. You want to be able to reach out and grab your controls comfortably. You don't want to have to reach down or have to reach up. So with the customer sitting on the bike, make sure that the handlebar height is correct. Make sure the lever, level ang lever angle is correct and comfortable for them. So that means a lot in being able to operate it comfortably. Yeah, that is definitely very important. And there are different seats. Uh, this seat, you don't do much of adjustment. It's a standard seat, it's a stock seat, you can slide back and forth. And then if we use an optional solo seat or tractor style, vintage style seat, those you have an option and those are mechanical adjustments. We can add the spacer. Yeah, that raises it up about yes. an inch. And we can also move the seat uh, back and forth. Usually you put it all the way back, but mm -hmm. you can't potentially bring it. Yeah, there's two sets of holes, so you have an either and or. That is correct. And we have a whole video on the Ural seats option, so definitely check that out. But as far as controls, these are very, very important. And we uh, set them for the average uh, person height and uh, arm length and so forth. But yes, we can fine tune it when uh, you take the delivery of the bike. And not to mention, you can also fine tune it yourself by loosening certain things and make sure you tighten things back up. So I think that's, uh, that covers the uh, fine tuning of the controls. We also need to cover the importance of the protective gear, helmet, eye protection, body protection. Yep. Should You've been riding for gear. how long? Uh, about 50 years now, more yep. or less. So yeah, very important eye protection, good helmet, um, jacket, pants, boots, um, yeah, all this is very important stuff to protect you because, let's face it, you're still on a motorcycle. Absolutely. Um, then we have um, customer questions answered. Um, we will get into Q&As. We covered most of it, but we still have three or four typical follow-up questions that we sometimes run into on the follow-up call or maybe a customer calls us. So we'll cover that. And then warranty was explained. Mm -hmm. Uh, warranty registration uh, information is confirmed. 
Yeah, we take care of that for you. Once, once you take delivery of your motorcycle, you don't have to do anything else. We register the motorcycle with Ural and this starts your warranty. And this doesn't happen until you physically take delivery of it. And complete, in order to start the warranty registration. This, is, this paperwork is required also to start the warranty process. Absolutely. Uh, Ural extended warranty program. Ural does offer another year's worth of factory warranty for 850 bucks. Covers just, just like taking your two-year warranty and moving it out another year. Great value. Um, they say it's with Ural, so nothing changes. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very good consideration. It's a very it good is. thing to offer. And yes, right now at the time of this video, this is what the cost of this additional year. It uh, may change. It probably will change down the road. We are surprised. The... It's been eight fifty for a long time. So that's true. Yeah. So I guess that's a good thing. But just keep that in mind. We're in a year twenty twenty two. So we have extended warranty program explained, and we'll touch on this a tiny little bit. We also have a very successful extended. Uh, aftermarket yeah, we do. Coverage. We do offer an aftermarket warranty as well. I think depending on, I think you can extend it three, three maybe years. three years yep. three further years. Than, than the two you have. What a lot of people will do is they'll get the Ural warranty extension, and then after that, they'll get the aftermarket. That gives you a total of six years coverage. Absolutely. So there are all these different options and the products we offer, they're, they're good products. And, we... and the other thing too, when you're talking about extended warranty is timing. Um, the, the, uh, all, all the warranties have to be put in place before the prior warranty expires. Uh, the Euro, Euro one, the extension on it, uh, they're, they're uh, very easy to work with that one. As long as you purchase it and it's in place before the, before the prior two years are, are done, you're okay. The aftermarket warranty, you have to have at least 30 days of factory warranty left before you can purchase the aftermarket new bike warranty. You can still purchase a warranty, but yeah. it's going to cost you a lot more money if you lapse in that and have to start over again. So these are very important topics, Daryl. Thank you for remembering that. Um, maintenance and off-season storage. Um, so we covered the maintenance. Off-season storage. Uh, it's just like most any other motorcycle. You make sure you put the bike away clean. You purchase a battery tender to maintain the battery. Uh, you fill the gas tank completely full, add stabilizer, run the fuel, stabilized fuel through the injectors to make sure you have the whole system stabilized with stabilized fuel, and then put it away for the winter. One thing yep. you don't yep. want to do, a lot, this is kind of an old wives tale about going out and starting a bike every couple of weeks. Do not do, do this. That, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. And again, depending on how long you plan on storing the bike, Probably bumping up tire pressure a little bit would not hurt. Would not hurt anything. Tires are tires are a lot better than they used to be. Uh, back back in the day, they wanted you to get the tires off the ground because they were worried about flat spotting. Uh, it's not really the case anymore. But a few extra psi in the tires is not a bad idea. And maybe even rolling it a foot back and forth once in a while. Yeah, it certainly will make you feel better. It would make me feel better. Mm. But uh, next one on the list is the uh, writing tips, skills, test, practice, guide, reviewed. That's a lot of words, uh, but they're all very important ones. So writing tips, we covered a little bit. We covered it this. to some degree. And we also want to cover, since we, we need to cover some tips, what about leaning? And why should someone consider leaning? It becomes natural as you ride more, but should we? You do, and there's a certain amount of body English you can put in a, in a sidecar rig to take maximum advantage of handling. It's not near as, as needed as with the motorcycle because you're not counter steering, but it, it will have an effect on, on the way the motorcycle handles. Absolutely. And it actually is, again, to, uh, well, well, we'll get back to this one, but let's talk about uh, test and practice. As we mentioned earlier, uh, safe environment, no traffic, no pedestrians. If you can find a location like that, that's a great spot to uh, 
exercise and, and do different things. And actually in the owner's manual, there are some exercises that are mentioned with reducing the radius and kind of getting the feel for the sidecar dynamics. So all those things are available, some of them in your owner's manual, and we can certainly a great resource if you want to reach out to us, but there are some tests and practices that one can do. And there's also, I send this out to all my customers too, there's a, a, a book that Ural produced a few years ago, How to Ride a Ural. Yeah. That goes into great detail on handling characteristics, uh, lot uh, parking lot tests and tr uh, you know training and stuff like that you could do yourself, cone layouts for practice drills and so it's it's a it's a pretty good pretty good resource for learning how to ride the bike properly. And it's a very important thing to do. Uh, I know you get a new thing, you want to jump on it, you want to go, and you probably have a lot of riding skills just because as a motorcyclist, maybe you have been riding a lot, but this is a different motor vehicle. It looks like a motorcycle. In fact, it is a motorcycle, but altogether, it's a thing by itself. Mm -hmm. So let's keep that in mind. Uh, keys received. We covered what each key does but we do have how many sets? You have two sets of keys that come with the bike. Also keep in mind that on that key ring, there's a key code tag. That key, that, that code tag allows you to order another ignition key if need be. You wanna make sure you do not leave that key code tag on your key ring where people can find it. That is true, that's a good point. Uh, and then the last one is the owner manual received and reviewed with the customer. So we covered the owner's manual and we, what we would do, we'd go through the whole owner's manual, kind of flip through the pages, give, show you some sections of um, the owner's manual. And there are sections, even there's a full electrical diagram for the bike. Yeah, there's a place, uh, it even tells you how to, uh, how to induce flash codes through the check engine light to diagnose fuel injection. Absolutely, so you, um, you can yourself say by accident a certain connector or something was knocked and you didn't notice that, you will have the check engine light flashing and then through the owner's manual instructions you can flash it in a certain sequence that you can interpret and it will tell you which sensor mm -hmm. you need to look at. Really cool stuff. So we are actually done with the customer checklist. We've done with all the paperwork. Uh, there are some things we haven't done uh, as a part of this orientation. We obviously have not taken the bike out for, uh, for a ride. Today is raining, but this is something that uh, we would absolutely do with the bike owner. And we haven't started the bike, but now that we're wrapping up this video, so maybe we should get it started. See how easy it is to go back to that starting procedure. Yeah. Key on, starter button. So, like I yeah. said, that's pretty much it. Absolutely. And we do have such a thing, and it's called a Kickstarter. There is a Kickstarter on this on every Ural. On every Ural. Um, so, and historically, it was the only way to start a Ural motorcycle. This was way back. Mm -hmm. And then they introduced the electric starter and it was a carbureted bike. And with the carbureted bike, you need a quarter of a turn and the bike, a properly tuned Ural motorcycle will start on a quarter of a turn. With a minimal amount of battery voltage too. Absolutely. It would be almost unreal. You kind of like touch that, you just give it like a little something and then a boom and the bike runs. With the fuel injected motorcycle, the engine needs to complete a full 360 revolution. At a certain speed. At a certain speed in order to get going. So this is not a reliable way to start your Ural motorcycle. If you're in a GM, if, you, uh, if something is not allowing the starter to crank, you may end up Push starting. You may end up push, push starting, starting it. it. So I know this has been a long video. We appreciate you guys sticking through it. We have hope we've been able to give you a lot of useful information, um, some helpful tips and that sort of thing. So we really, really appreciate your business. We appreciate you watching the video. Um, Dimitri, what would you like to say? Well, um, definitely a thank you for your business. Uh, we couldn't have done it without, without you. We've sold thousands of Ural motorcycles 
Many of them have an incredible level of accessories. We stay in touch with all of our customers by simply means of emails, phone calls. We do the events, we do the rallies. But for now, we definitely want to thank you for watching this video. Consider subscribing to the channel so you don't miss an exciting content. And please consider sharing. And uh, this is Dimitri and Daryl and Ian and Wiley reporting from our Boxborough location.